Well, I think all countries are coming to realise that virtually all policy decisions have a science, technology dimension to them. That better policy is made when that, that, that science, science and innovation dimension is integrated properly into the policy development process. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's natural science, social science, physical science, in fact, all of them, it can, can play a major role in virtually every issue that we think about. Now, how that's done will differ very much by culture and constitutional arrangements, but I think around the world it's now being identified that unless you have a specific component of your ecosystem which is responsible for the science, for policy translation, and for the policy to science translation, um, the country doesn't have the full benefit of knowledge in its decision making. Now in New Zealand, it's a, and in England, and in Australia, that's the chief science advisor. In some countries it's done by a committee. I happen to think individuals do it better than committees because it allows you a chance to have very frank conversations with your political, uh, political uh, masters. It's not the same thing as having a Ministry of Science. And the Ministry of Science is a great development for Chile, I think, because it means that there is a particular argument for science and the role of science innovation at the cabinet table, in the budget decisions, in all the other things that happen. But the Ministry of Science's role is to develop policy for the science system. What the role is of people like myself is primarily to take knowledge and see how that can be used to benefit my country through using evidence better in everything from social policy to crisis management to, um, uh, to environmental management, to health services, to transport, uh, to economic growth. And so it's a different dimension. And I think while there is some overlap, I'm a more trusted uh, advocate for the use of evidence and policy if I'm not at the same time trying to say, I'm trying to say to the government, this is the way the science system should run, this is where the priorities are, this is where the money should go and give us more money. So it's, it's, it's a matter, and I think most countries who have science advisory systems recognise the need to have at least some separation of the science for policy from the policy for science. Well, I'm heavily engaged as uh, chair of the International Network on Government Science Advice and trying to work with the UN and persuade the UN to, take this, to, take, to consider how to better use science in achieving the, the Sustainable Development Goals. Every goal requires science to make progress and there's two gaps. One is between what knowledge we have now, has that been synthesised and you, is it being used to its optimal value in the different contexts? And secondly, what science knowledge gaps do we have that need to be filled? There is no process at the UN level that's looking at those two questions systematically and we're making a strong argument that there needs to be or they need to arrange for that to happen, for example, through the International Council of Science, who has done some quite good analysis in this area. But there's another gap, and that gap is, policy may be made at the level of the UN, decisions may be made there, but the actions are actually taken out by the member states. So it's up to any country whether it wants to do this, or do that, or so forth. And so we need to see much better connectivity between nation science advisory mechanisms and 
the advisory mechanisms that exist in UN agencies. You know, organisations like World Health Organisation, United Nations Environmental Programme, they all have technical advisory groups, but they do their own thing with the UN, and yet the action happens at the level of individual governments. There's no connection. So INSA is arguing for a new structure which uh, would allow for vertical communication between science and the UN system and national science advisory mechanisms. And in fact, at the last Science and Technology Innovation Forum to advance the SDGs held in New York last year, the two decisions, the two points that came out of the discussion, which I was heavily involved in, were one, that every country should develop a science advisory mechanism, and secondly, the UN should develop a mechanism so it can coordinate at its level its scientific inputs and link that to, um, to um, national systems. Bizarrely, while it wasn't a very effective body, the UN has actually closed its science advisory system rather than expanding it to re meet the SDGs. So there's a lot of action here and over the next few months, I think there'll be a lot of lobbying of the UN to look at itself better. And in fact, INSA has on its website a manifesto on how to address these issues, which is open for public consultation until, February the, until January the 31st, and that will form the basis of a presentation to the UN in June. Well, part of my role is, and part of my terms of reference, is to promote science communication and science education. I've written for the government reports on both those topics, but more importantly, we actually work between my office, the Ministry of Education, and the Ministry of Science on coordinating programs in science outreach, and we have some very increasingly important outreach programs. But the other thing I've done is because it's not just about school children and the public understanding and engaging in science, I also want their inputs into what I do. So we now have 30 relatively young policy makers and uh, scientists in Auckland and 30 in Wellington who I meet with once a month and who get involved in some of our projects. Uh, because I think, um, you know, your generation, to be honest, is the generation where the understanding that science is done and paid for by society for better outcomes for society is something that needs to be fundamental to the way people like myself act.